In the second half of August, the division was ordered to hand over its defence area to other units to load into echelons at the Polar Railway Station and redeploy to Ukraine, to the Steppe Front, which together with other fronts participated in the Battle of Kursk. We had a young Captain Kukovenko as a division commander. It was said that he was the son-in-law of our division commander, General A.F. Kazankin. He gathered officers from each battery, and by car we went to Polar Station for reconnaissance of the place and conditions of loading. Soon, having loaded into an echelon, the division set out on the road through Moscow and the recently liberated cities Oral, Kursk, Belgorod. Having unloaded at night at the station Slatino, near Kharkov, our division settled down in the forest, not far from the station Dagachi. In the distance, about 10 kilometres away, we could see Kharkov, for which there was still a fierce battle. After the northwestern front, with its dense coniferous forests and boundless swamps, Ukraine seemed to us a paradise. In the morning, waking up in the forest, we saw apple and pear trees with fruit, and although they were decots, bitter and sour, they seemed sweet and quite edible to us. Next to the forest stretched a large field of ripe corn, which we made quick use of we boiled as much as we could fit into walks and buckets. The booms of artillery fire and bombing could be heard clearly, although our neighbourhood was not hit. In the first days of September 1943, the division concentrated near the village of Dergachi. Here we received replenishment of men and equipment. Instead of horse traction, all batteries were transferred to Metiaga. As tracked as we received new American cars, Studebaker. After restaffing, the division spent a few days training the young replenishment, forming units for skillful combat. The training ended with tactical exercises of the division with live firing near Kharkov, where fierce fighting was still going on a few days ago. Regiments of the division stormed the enemy defences, and as targets instead of the enemy used enemy equipment, including tanks, of which there were many in the area. Soon the division was ordered to march to the Dnieper. The German troops, having suffered defeat at Kursk, Kharkov and Poltava, were hastily withdrawing westward over the Dnieper. On the right bank of the Dnieper, the Germans created a powerful defensive line, called the Eastern Wall, and announced to the world that the eastern border of the Reich henceforth runs along the Dnieper. To create this frontier, the Germans widely involved the local population. The fact that in the middle of September 1943, two weeks before our troops reached the Dnieper River, Hitler personally came to Zaporozhye to check the readiness of the eastern rampart speaks about its importance. This defensive line really looked impregnable. The Dnieper itself is a serious water obstacle. At that time its width was 500 to 700 metres with a fairly strong current. The right bank, where the Nazis were defending, is high and dominates over the left bank. From it, the approaches to the Dnieper from the left bank were perfectly visible, and of course everything was shot through with aimed fire. The enemy had time to create a deeply echeloned defence and fire system here. The left bank, from where we were to force the Dnieper, is a low-lying, sandy, swampy place. In addition, the Nazis tried to destroy everything that could somehow facilitate our forcing. The appearance of even single soldiers near the Dnieper caused fierce machine gun and mortar fire of the enemy. Our division was part of the 37th Army of the Steppe Front, later renamed the 2nd Ukrainian Front. It was commanded by the famous commander, later Marshal of the Soviet Union Ivan Stepanovich Konov. The army was assigned a combat task acting on a wide front to reach the Dnieper south of Kremenchug and having crossed it to seize a bridgehead on the eastern bank. The advanced units, knocking down the enemy's barriers, were rushing to the Dnieper. I remember well the mood of soldiers and officers of our battery to get to the Dnieper as quickly as possible, to force it, not to give the enemy a chance to gain a foothold on this frontier. Everyone was striving for the Dnieper. Our division was still in the second echelon of the army and moved after the advanced units. We passed Poltava, then Kobiaki. It was the second half of September, the weather was warm and sunny. The enemy periodically bombed our troops, but our column was not bombed yet. By the end of September we approached the Dnieper. Observing careful camouflage, at night we set up an observation post near the water on a sandy bank in the shrubbery. To the left, in the area of the village of Mishurin Rog, which was on the right bank, the advanced units forced the Dnieper at night and captured a small bridgehead. There was a fierce battle, 
continuous rumbling of bursting shells and mines, machine gun and machine gun, machine gun bursts, rifle shots, continuous bombing and air battles merged into a cruel, powerful and heavy rumble of battle. The earth trembled. At dawn, the entire water surface of the Dnieper was covered with troops crossing the river, some on boats, obviously previously hidden by the population in the reeds, some on homemade small rafts. A few barrels of gasoline, tied with wire, on top of a barn gate, or something similar that's the raft. It took a lot of effort and skill to cross the Dnieper on such a structure. There were few means of transportation. All this avalanche of troops, manoeuvring as far as they could between the gaps, were unstoppably rushing to the right bank. Shouts, cursing, groans of the wounded, the roaring of frightened horses, all this was interwoven into the sounds of battle. The enemy fiercely resisted, seeking to eliminate the captured bridgeheads. Dozens of attacks per day had to repel our units on the other bank. Fire and tactical advantage was on the side of the Germans. Full profile trenches, communication lines, equipped firing points, the presence of tanks and armoured personnel carriers allowed the enemy to successfully defend and counterattack our small units forcing the river. All night there is a crossing of the Dnieper. Nearby at night a pontoon bridge is being built. The 5th Tank Army, the main striking force of the front, is crossing it in a continuous stream of tanks and artillery. At dawn, the bridge is drawn up and hid in parts in the coastal bushes. The bridge is a desirable target for enemy aviation and artillery, and it is the only one on our bridgehead. Therefore the rest of the units cross the Dnieper who can, mostly on makeshift rafts. There were few anti-aircraft weapons. Our fighter aviation, as a rule, was bound to fight with enemy fighters, and at that time bombers did their job bombing and storming our crossing units. At the same time, however, our bombers and attack planes were processing the enemy's fighting orders, helping our troops to fight a fierce battle on the bridgehead. It turned out that from above, somewhere in one and a half kilometres from the ground fighters were fighting. We could hear furious machine gun and cannon cues. One or another airplane falls to the ground or into the water. Some debris is, is falling from above. At the same time below our bombers and attack aircraft are flying to bomb the enemy, and the enemy bombers are bombing us. This pattern from early morning until late evening was repeated daily. Our division is still in the second echelon of the 37th Army, on the left bank of the Dnieper. Its entry into battle without the permission of the front is forbidden. But our artillery regiment has taken up firing positions and is firing at the request of the units on the bridgehead. We occupy an observation post in the coastal bushes near the water. The crossing goes to our left. Opposite us on the opposite bank of the enemy defence. There the bank is high and steep. Our positions are well viewed and shot even by machine gun fire. We have to carefully observe camouflage measures. The appearance of even individual soldiers on the shore caused fierce enemy fire. I am thirsty. It is still hot in the daytime. It is September. The weather is sunny. But we can reach the Dnieper only at night, although the water is only 40 to 50 metres away. Soon we receive an order to take an observation point on the bridgehead. Early in the morning in the first days of October, 1943, I with my scouts help some crossing unit to build a raft. A few iron barrels, half-rotten cemetery gates on top, some tomb crosses, old boards, wreaths. On this raft fit two horses with a 45 mm gun, three men of the calculation and me with my three scouts. Early in the morning, after dark we set off from the shore, in hands who had what a shovel, a piece of board, a stick, and who even with his hands, lying on the raft, rode to the other bank. The whole river is dotted with troops crossing. The German does not see us yet. As usual, over the front edge of the enemy flares are constantly flying, but they do not reach the river. We sail slowly forward. The raft is noticeably drifting, the current of the Dieppe is fast, and it is necessary to get exactly to the appointed place, otherwise the current will carry us to the enemy. On the bridgehead not far from the river is the village of Mishurin Rog. The Dnieper here has steep, high banks. They go away from the shore into the steppe, forming a rather large coastal horseshoe-shaped hollow in which the village is located. It is known for the fact that before the war Mark Ozanoi, a famous corn grower throughout the country, worked there. 
we have to swim to this village. So far we are rowing and slowly approaching the opposite shore. Dawn catches us somewhere near the middle of the river. The enemy discovered our crossing and opened a strong artillery and mortar fire. Here and there shells and mines burst in the water, raising fountains of water. Already there are direct hits or bursts near rafts like ours. One can hear the cries of the wounded, the drowning, the neighing of the frightened horses that have fallen into the water. The dead go quietly under the water. Our raft is not in trouble yet, and we row with all our might to the other shore. Soon enemy aviation appears, and from the height of 200 to 300 metres bombs the crossing. We can see well not only airplanes with released landing gear junkers 88, but even enemy pilots in the cockpits. There is little anti-aircraft artillery one or two batteries are firing at enemy planes, choked with bursts. The results of anti-aircraft gunners are not yet visible. The enemy is doing its job with impunity. Soon one of the bombs exploded in the water near our raft. Before we could even realise what was going on, our raft was on the fringes, lifted by the blast wave. We were in the water, or rather, under the water. I came to my senses underwater, too. I surfaced, grabbing air with my mouth, floundering in the water. I'm wearing an overcoat, boots and all my belongings. All this is wet and pulls me down. I desperately paddle with my hands to keep myself up. The water is already cold, October is not the time for water procedures. But now I am not up to it, frantically looking for something to hold on to. Not far away is our raft, or rather, its pieces. I cling to it, my scouts are floundering around, horses have surfaced. All this, of course, is accompanied by wild shouts and screams. And the enemy continues his fierce bombing. When another airplane approaches us, we sink under the water, holding on to the rest of the raft. Our clothes are wet, pulling us down, and the shore is not less than 300 to 300 to 350 metres away. But everyone is rowing forward, I don't remember anyone turning around. Finally my feet reach the bottom of shoal, and near a small sandy spit about 30 to 40 metres long and 4 to 5 metres wide. On it gathered like us, who pours water out of boots, who undresses to squeeze at least a little wet clothes. Enemy junkers, having bombed on the crossing troops, noticed our island, on which, like hares in a flood, our soldiers crowded together. With a wild howling, diving and firing from machine guns and cannons, the enemy planes crashed on the islet. The dead fell, the wounded screamed, the survivors swore. We are practically defenceless, there is nowhere to take cover, there is water all around. Some throw themselves into the water, but the bullets reach there. We clench our fists in rage, it is useless to fire at the planes with a machine gun or rifle. Besides, many of us were without weapons, they had obviously drowned in the river, and I had no weapons at all. At last the planes left. A small boat with a ferry on pontoons came to the island. They picked up the wounded, took the living, and to the opposite shore. So I managed to get to the right bank of the Dnieper. The village of Mishurin Rog is located in a wide valley. The enemy does not reach here by rifle and machine gun fire, and does not see the bursts of his shells and mines. The village is almost intact, only a few houses destroyed by bombs. Near one of the outermost houses we stopped, undressed, dried ourselves by a small fire and moved forward. The front edge is about a kilometre and a half higher. Not far from the ravine we chose a base. With the onset of darkness we dig trenches for it. We take the ground on cloak tents to the nearest ravine, so that the enemy did not find us by the freshly dug ground. On our direction in the hands of the Germans a small village, marked on the map as a state farm Nezamoznik. For several days we have been conducting surveillance of the enemy. It is relatively quiet in our area. Heavy fighting is not far from us, two or three kilometres behind the village Dernevka. The Germans are stubbornly defending this, and several other villages Borodayevka, Kutsivolovka, Uspensko. The rumble of battle is not silent for a minute. Only at night, for a few hours, the fighting stops, so that in the morning it flares up with renewed vigour. Our division by this time carried out the crossing of the Dnieper, mainly at night. At the same time, the 18th Tank Corps of the 5th Tank Army was crossing to the right bank by the bridge, which was also built at night. The offensive of the steppe front on the bridgehead near the village of Mishurinrog was scheduled for October 15th. On the night of October 14th to 15th, 
the battalion commander of the 13th Guards Airborne Regiment of our division, chose his CP on a neutral territory, 50 to 100 metres from our front line, in order to better control the battalion during the attack of the Nezamozhnik State Farm. I and my scouts were with the battalion commander. In our area, the artillery preparation before the attack was not planned because of lack of ammunition. It was carried out somewhere on the right, near the village of Denevka. It had not yet dawned properly when the battalion commander signalled the start of the attack. Paratroopers without a single shot crawled across the field towards the enemy trenches near the farm Nezamozhnik, up to the enemy 300 metres. The battalion commander decided to crawl stealthily to the enemy's defence, and then a surprise attack to stun him and capture the farm. On the right and left in the dawn haze can be seen hundreds of crawling paratroopers. When up to the front edge of the Germans remained 100 to 150 metres, the battalion commander gives the command companies to stand up. In the attack forward, the paratroopers jumped up and rushed into the attack. The soldiers hurrah, rattled. For the enemy, our attack was a complete surprise. We observe how enemy soldiers jump out of dugouts, surviving houses, shooting indiscriminately, in panic fleeing for the village. Our paratroopers fiercely attack. Here and there are hand-to-hand -hand skirmishes. Our soldiers have already broken into the village. The battalion commander, sticking out of the trench, shouting something, trying to control the battalion. We, too, in the excitement of the battle rose above the trench, shouting something to the soldiers running past. Suddenly flames and the rumble of a shell burst near our trench. I was stunned and concussed. I woke up at the bottom of the trench. One of the scouts was shaking me, shouting something, but I could not hear anything. There was some noise and ringing in my ears. I tried to get up. Nearby the wounded moaning, someone killed. The battalion commander is lying at the bottom of the trench. Immediately the orderly brings him to his senses. It seems that he is unharmed. Not far away Captain Yurchenko, the deputy commander of our division, is sitting in the trench, holding his head also shell-shocked, but alive. We hardly got out of the trench. It turns out that the enemy had noticed our position and fired at us from a cannon. The shell hit the base of the bunker, and the shrapnel in front of us flew up and over the sides, so the wounded and killed were on our right and left. And in the centre of the trench where we were, the shock wave concussed and stunned everyone. The battalion commander was rendered speechless, his mouth open, but he couldn't say anything. He was sent to the rear. Yurchenko began to stutter, and I was damaged hearing. Soon we followed the troops into the state farm. We had not even managed to pass half of the village when the enemy aviation came and started bombing. We see one of the bombs rapidly approaching the place where we are. There is a cellar nearby, we throw ourselves into it. Somewhere nearby there is a powerful bomb explosion, the earth falls from the ceiling. There are several barrels in the cellar, we hide between them. The bombs fall further and we raise our heads. One of the scouts has already managed to put his hand into the barrel and pulls out a large red pickled tomato. With pleasure we treat ourselves to the tomatoes. In another barrel there were pickled apples, we try them too. But it's time to go forward. The raid is over, we jump out of the cellar and follow the advancing troops. The enemy is trying to counterattack, but he can no longer stop our attack. We are advancing towards the railway station Piety Hatki, which is 50 kilometres away. By the end of the day, on October 15th, we reached the boundary of the small village Lykovka, however, the enemy offered stubborn resistance, and we could not take the village in the evening. The soldiers were tired, the rear lagged behind, the combat order stretched. After all, during the day we passed about 15 kilometres an unprecedented success. Usually, when breaking through the enemy's defences, advancement of 3 to 5 kilometres was considered a success, but here all 15 kilometres. The enemy did not expect the main blow here. We spend the night in the field, who can? It's pouring rain. Hungry, it is hopeless to expect that someone will bring food. Some of the scouts are frugal, took a few soaked apples in a duffel bag, and thanks to that. Early in the morning again attack on Lykovka. After a stubborn battle the enemy leaves the village. Without delaying here we continue the offensive. Here and there, the enemy leaves ambushes to delay our advance and break away. The second day continues our offensive on the bridgehead. 
The first trip of the enemy's defense is broken through. His resistance has weakened considerably separate counterattacks in small groups, rifle and machine gun fire at some borders and shelling by long-range artillery with separate shots at random. On the second day in the morning a fine, cold, tedious rain sows, but because of it there is low cloud cover and German aviation does not operate. Yesterday it all day long tormented our fighting orders with bombing and assault strikes. Our aviation is constrained at the Dnieper crossing, there are continuous air battles. We have no anti-aircraft means, and our rifle and machine gun fire of the enemy aviation practically does not bring any harm. But today the bad weather is to our advantage, although of course we have to crawl across the muddy fields in wet overcoats, which reduces the pace of the offensive. The commander of the battalion, which supports our battery, decided to attack in the pre-combat order companies move in column one by one in a chain. This speeds up the tempo of the movement. I, with my scouts and communicators, go behind the head company, following the battalion commander. Now the main task for us is to move as quickly as possible into the depths of the enemy's defence, not to give him the opportunity to organise defence at a new line. In addition, ahead of the railroad junction the station Piety Hatki. It is necessary to seize it faster and cut the railroads going from Kiev to Dina Petrovske and from Kremenchug to Krivoy Rog. The Germans are still sitting in both cities. We are moving along a rather deep gully. On our right we sometimes hear the sounds of tank engines, but the rain and haze hide them from us. Whose tanks are those? The battalion commander sends a small reconnaissance group to find out the situation on the right flank, and we continue to move forward. We pass the village of Lykovka. On the outskirts we make a small break. Of course there is no kitchen in sight. It is floundering somewhere behind, in the mud. The locals report that the Germans left last night in the direction of Piatikatok. Obviously, they expect to organise a defence there. We have to hurry, otherwise we will have to break through it, and this will mean new victims. On October 18th, 1943, we approached the station Piety Hatki in the dark. It was a moonless night, and although there was no rain, the sky was covered with clouds. Battalions silently unfold into combat order in a chain. Somewhere on the right must be a few tanks of the 18th Tank Corps. It is their engines we heard during the day. There is no time to organise interaction, the importance of surprise. In addition, tanks at night in a populated area will not go from any angle you can get an anti-tank grenade or run into a mine, and manoeuvre will be very difficult. Even earlier these issues have been agreed, and the tankers must go around the settlements. Soon the conditional signal is sounded, and battalions with a wild cry of hurrah rush into the attack on the station. In the darkness machine gun and machine gun bursts crackle, rifle shots clap and hand grenades burst. We run in a common chain, and also desperately shout something similar to hurrah. The excitement of the battle is growing. To all appearances, the enemy did not expect that we would reach Piatikatki today. During the day we walked on the mud about 20 kilometres. But that's what we are paratroopers, for us surprise, you could say, the main weapon. Here are the outskirts of the houses. We run down the street, it's dark, but we guess the battalion's combat order by the sound of gunfire. Our weapon is different from the German one, and it helps us to orient ourselves. Our battalion is left flanking. It must advance along the railroad bed, take the elevator, the train station and other objects near the station. Fierce fighting breaks out in one place or another. Apparently the enemy has several armoured personnel carriers here, with which he manoeuvres through the streets. The firing goes farther and farther to the outskirts of the station. After about two hours the firing begins to subside. The Germans, caught by surprise, could not organise serious resistance to our units. But for a long time, then in one place, then in another place, the firing broke out. It is scattered groups of the enemy ran into our soldiers, fleeing from the city. Not far from the station, burning two enemy armoured personnel carriers, hit by our soldiers. The battalion is fixed on the outskirts of the station, along the railroad bed. The battalion commander, Captain Shatrov, who was later awarded the title of Hero of the Soviet Union for the capture of Piety Hatki, although our entire division was advancing there, organised his CP at the railway station. Here and my CP, although at night, of course, not much to see. 
Our assault on Payati Hatok was so unexpected for the enemy that he did not have time to blow up almost anything. The elevator was intact, and as it turned out later, full of grain. The gasoline depot, or rather the oil depot with huge tanks filled with fuel, was also intact. Even some electric lights were burning somewhere. The scouts are resourceful people, and while I was doing my business they got a bucket of boiled eggs somewhere, and we had dinner with pleasure, as we had nothing else but breadcrumbs. As it turned out, the Germans had laid several thousand eggs for their soldiers, and we got them. Soon I was searched for by the deputy commander of our division, Captain Yurchenko, with the order of the division commander, Captain Kukovenko, to find fuel and refuel the vehicles of the division, which by that time had already approached the outskirts of Payatikatak. Soon my scouts found out where the oil depot was, and we went there to look for gasoline. Not far from the railroad tracks through the trees we could see tanks of the oil depot. I had a trophy flashlight bug, and we quickly found a tank of gasoline. Soon our cars arrived and began to fill up. The railroad tracks nearby were jammed with trains. Yochenko suggested we go to see what was in the cars. We came closer to the train I to one car, Yochenko to another. With difficulty I opened the wide door of the freight car and climbed in. It was dark in the car, I couldn't see anything, it was dangerous to turn on the flashlight, there were still some machine gun bursts on the tracks. I closed the door of the car, turned on the flashlight and literally stunned, as they say goosebumps crept up my back. Along the walls of the wagon on the straw sat Germans and looked at me. I rushed to the door, but it was not easy to open it. While I was opening the door, I kept my eyes on the Krolts, but they did not show any hostile intentions. Moreover, they did not move at all, and, as it seemed to me, looked frightened. I pushed the nearest German with my foot, and he fell on his side like a sack, still watching. I pushed the second one the same result. I realized that the Germans were dead. I jumped out of the wagon, and immediately Yurchenko jumped out of the next wagon. There were dead German soldiers there too. We opened several more wagons, and everywhere were dead. Only in one wagon there was a wild hysterical scream. Yurchenko launched there a German gas mask in an iron box, which he took in the wagon, and we went away. It was also possible to get a machine gun line from some mad kraut. Much later I read in the memoirs, it seems Marshal Konov, who at that time commanded our front, that at Payati Hatki station the Germans abandoned two echelons of their wounded, having previously poisoned them. Having filled the cars with gasoline, Yurchenko took the column out of town, where the batteries of our division took firing positions, and I returned to my station at the station of the station, and there told the battalion commander about this case. Shatrov in turn said that his soldiers also found an echelon with poisoned wounded, but when they were inspecting it, then from one of the cars there was a machine gun burst. Our soldiers, of course, did not stay in debt, especially since some of them were wounded. After the war, at one of the meetings of our comrades in arms in Piety Hatki, recalling the events of that night, a tank colonel, hero of the Soviet Union, said that when we stormed the station, he and his tanks bypassed Piety Hatki from the right flank and cut the railroad. One tank he put right on the railroad bed. Soon a small train of several cars, including passenger cars, showed up. The train was forced to stop. The company commander entered the passenger car. In the first compartment was a German colonel who shouted in a wild voice, partisan, partisan, and immediately fell down and died of fright. As it turned out, it was the military commandant with his entourage there was something to give up. The tanker, the company commander, wore a beard and moustache. With his helmet on, the hair from his beard, moustache and head was sticking out in all directions, and he, like any other tanker, was covered in diesel oil and fuel oil. The effect was exceptional. By the morning of October 19th, 1943, the battle for Piety Hatki gradually quieted down. Regimental units were entrenched on the outskirts of the settlement. It was not excluded that the enemy would try to make a counterattack to regain the station, especially since there was a lot of his property here. Soon my comrade Ivan Yakovlevich Kulikov, a platoon commander like me, only from the neighbouring 5th Battery, came up to me. He and I knew each other from the northwestern front. It turned out that not far from Payatihatok was his native village, 
where his mother, sisters and other relatives lived. He had left before the war and, naturally, did not know if his relatives were still alive, just as they did not know anything about Ivan. The division commander let us go until evening, and we rode on horseback to the village of Kulakova, which was about twelve kilometres away. The road was muddy, but we reached the place in an hour and a half. In the village, which, like Piety Hatki, had been liberated the day before by General Pleve's cavalry corps, we quickly found Ivan's native house, the yard of which was full of horses and carts. No sooner had we entered the yard than enemy bombers appeared and began to turn over the village for a bombing run. There were no anti-aircraft facilities, and the enemy planes, having descended to a height of about 500 metres, began to bomb the village. We quickly tied the horses and rushed to the vegetable garden, where Ivan knew they had a cellar. At that time one of the airplanes dropped a bomb on the house we were near. I saw the bomb flying straight at us, and I shouted to Ivan jump. Together with the terrible howl of the bomb we fell into the cellar, and at the same time the bomb exploded fifteen metres from the cellar. The ground fell from the ceiling, and we were shaken. We heard a woman's frightened scream and the crying of children. In the soon hushed noise in the cellar, where Ivan and I had literally fallen in together with the bomb explosion, and where it was dark, Ivan's quiet voice was heard mum. Are you here? A woman's voice whispered with fright and tears, Oh, breathe, I can smell Vanka's voice, Chi I am on Tizem, Chi I am on Tim Switty. Ivan rushed to his mother with the words Mamo. I'm here, I'm here, Mamo. I think it is easy to understand the situation and the confusion of Ivan's frightened relatives, especially since the enemy air raids continued. Now, having dropped bombs, the enemy airplanes continued to storm the village, firing from cannons and machine guns. Recognising her son, the mother both rejoiced and cried, hugging him, kissing and wailing. Soon the enemy planes flew away, we crawled out of the cellar, Ivan's relatives came after us, other relatives came running. Weeping, lamentations, tears of joy, a feeling of fear that had not yet passed from the bombing that had just ended, especially since someone had been killed, someone wounded. The cavalrymen began to saddle and harness their horses to leave the village faster, as it was clear that the enemy would not leave such a target alone. The roaring of the horses, the shouts of the riders and cavalrymen, the groans of the wounded, the strained howling of the engines of the vehicles tugging in the mud, all this added to the anxious and joyful picture of Ivan's meeting with his relatives at the same time. His mother hastily gathered something to eat, we refreshed ourselves and began to say goodbye, we could not linger. Again weeping, sobbing, painful and sad moments of parting. Soon we were on our way back to Piety Hatki. In the afternoon we were in the village, and in time the division was already preparing for the march. Now our way was to Krivoy Rog, which was about 60 to 70 kilometres away. The column of the division on Studebaker cars, which we had recently received, moved forward. It was already dark when we entered the village of Anivka. Here the division settled down for the night. Dinner and blissful rest who settled down where? In the morning, having had breakfast, we started to get ready for the road. The column of the division stretched out. Soon it left the village. We approached a low but dense grove. It is to the right of the road on which we are travelling. Suddenly the air observers shouted, Air! Air the signal of an enemy air raid. With anxiety we look up into the sky. From the south, from the side of Krivoy Rog, a large group of enemy planes is approaching. They are coming in formation at a considerable height and in our direction. The commander of the division, Captain Kukovenko, gives a command to stop, press against the trees and quickly camouflage ourselves with branches. Feverishly breaking bushes, camouflage vehicles in the hope that the enemy will not notice us. It was a tragic mistake of the commander. We should have increased speed, distance between the vehicles and continued to move forward. And now we became an ideal immobile target for enemy aircraft, especially since there were no anti-aircraft weapons either at us or nearby. We were completely defenseless against the enemy. But of course everyone is strong in hindsight. Meanwhile the planes began to line up in a circle for bombing. There was no doubt that it was against us. Scouts counted more than 70 planes, that is, more than three for each of our cars. At that moment a tank jumped out of the bushes, 
to which our vehicles were pressed, and at full throttle rushed along our column, trying to hide from the bombing. All our camouflage was on the ground. There is no time to correct it, and it is useless the enemy knows well where the column stands. We run away from the cars into the bushes. About 20 to 25 metres away there are some square pits, about three by three metres and up to a metre deep. We fall into them, and the planes are already dive-bombing our column. We can clearly see how a bomb with a long pin in front of it, on which there is a special turntable making a heartbreaking sound, separates from the airplane. We squeeze into the bottom of the pit. The bomb falls somewhere nearby. We are tossed around and covered with earth. Before we could shake ourselves off, another airplane dives with a wild howl and throws another bomb, and again right at us. Someone cannot stand it, with a wild cry jumped up and ran deeper into the forest. Again we were shaken and covered with earth. The inferno lasted for what seemed like an eternity. Having used up their bombs, the planes began to rain down on us from cannons and machine guns. The lines were lying side by side, and even exactly on the pits. Shouts of the wounded several cars are burning. Finally the planes fly away. Fortunately, in our pit all alive and intact. The crews rush to the cars, unhook the guns from the burning cars, because in the bodies of the boxes with shells. Some of the soldiers are trying to extinguish the cars with earth. Our battery commander was wounded, screaming in pain, it turned out wounded with a pig bone and right on the lower joint of the leg. The thing is that in one of the cars there was a carcass of a slaughtered pig, the bomb blew up the car and together with it the carcass, and the bone hit the commander's leg. San Instructora run through the bushes, looking for and bandaging the wounded. We begin to check people. In my platoon there is no radio operator Pekka. Where he went, no one knows. We run through the nearest bushes. There are direct hits of bombs in the pits. There, of course, it's useless to search. Everything is mixed with earth. Soon the column of surviving vehicles moves forward, away from this unfortunate place. In the afternoon we are approaching Crivoy Rog. The column stops, dispersed by battalions in the nearest hollows. I was called by the division commander. Together with him, the chauffeur and a machine gunner on the Willis we go forward, we need to find out the situation, find our infantry, determine the area of the division's combat order and other issues. A dozen kilometres away, as in the sky at a low altitude appeared two enemy planes. One of them turned in our direction. The chauffeur quickly turned to the nearest spoon, stopped the car. We jumped out of it, ran away to the sides and lay down. The plane dropped to a height of 25 to 30 metres and began to pour machine gun fire on us. We, like hares, ran across the field, dodging machine gun bursts. For about 20 minutes the enemy pilot chased us around the field, firing from machine gun or from cannon. Fortunately we managed to survive this time, no one was wounded, and the car remained intact. Soon we approached Crivoy Rog. Ahead is a civil airfield, several mounds on its outskirts. We climb up one of the mounds ahead, two kilometres away, the outskirts of the city. Visibility is good, we decided to take up a position here. Not far away, two or three tanks behind the landing. Our infantry is not visible, probably has not yet approached. The commander went back, and I stayed with the scout at the base. Soon I learned from the tankers that in the evening three or four tanks had slipped into the town. There was heard machine gun and cannon fire, but now it has quieted down. The enemy had set up some guns on the outskirts, evidently anti-aircraft guns, which were direct firing at our tanks trying to break into the town. Soon we ourselves watched as our self-propelled vehicle passed us on the road, heading towards the town. We wave as hard as we can to stop it, but it keeps moving forward. A soldier from the self-propelled vehicle waves back at us, and at that moment an enemy shell hits the self-propelled vehicle. One soldier jumps out of there, another burst sounds the self-propelled vehicle stopped and smoked, no one from it showed up again. Soon our vehicles, with personnel of the control platoons, including mine, arrived. We of course met them on the approach so as not to expose them to enemy artillery fire. Platoons occupy observation posts, pulled up communication to firing positions communicators. The usual frontline work began. Soon it got dark, scouts began to dig trenches for observation posts, brought straw, 
We spend the night in the trenches. At dawn, we were observing the enemy. Enemy aviation is not slumbering. In the morning, several planes are already irradiating our fighting orders. We are also getting hit. One of the bombs falls on a neighboring mound, where the NP of the neighboring battery. A powerful explosion, a high column of earth, it seems that no one survived there. I send a scout to find out. Soon he returns, fortunately. Everyone is safe there. The bomb exploded literally five to seven meters away. Everyone was covered with earth, but people are already digging themselves out. The usual work is going on at the NP scouts are conducting surveillance of the enemy. Communicators and radio operators have established communication with the firing positions. By evening our infantry came up, began to dig in. Since the next morning the activity of our troops increased. Our batteries are firing at the enemy, he responds in the same way. Soon we hear a salvo of our Katyushas from behind. Each rocket launcher fires 16 weighty shells of 130mm calibre in one salvo. Each battery usually had four rocket launchers, a division had 12. Before we knew it, our mound instantly turned into a fiery volcano. The rumble of explosions, the whistle of shrapnel, fire and smoke mixed with dust covered everything around. I managed to dive into a niche at the bottom of the trench. We had dug niches in the side walls for everyone in advance, where we could hide from the shrapnel. The niche came in handy, but the ground above it collapsed and I was crushed. Soon the rupture stopped. I tried to crawl out from under the rubble, floundering in the ground. My head was full of earth. My mouth and nose. My ears, everything was clogged with earth. I managed to get out thanks to someone who helped. It was from the neighbouring mound, came to the rescue. We shake ourselves off, look around, everyone seems to be alive. Our barrow turned into a shapeless, funnelled heap of earth. It turned out that on our mound gave a volley of its own rocket launcher. Behind us about 200 metres on another mound, NP, reactive NP. Obviously the battery commander prepared the data and made a mistake, hit the wrong mound. There are several of them here, some on our side, some on the enemies. We look back through binoculars, waving our fists, sending curses. Reactivists urgently leave the NP, feeling their guilt. There is nothing for us to do on this NP. The whole mound is dug up by shells. Besides, the enemy is shooting at our positions with mortars. Ahead on the right, about 200 metres away, we can see some brick construction. It is almost all in the ground. The top protrudes about half a metre. We decide to move there. We run across, bypassing, we reach the intended place. It turned out to be an underground gasoline depot of the airfield. Inside there are several large tanks with aviation gasoline. The door is metal, but it faces the enemy. You can observe from here standing in a brick trench, where the warehouse door opens. No sooner had we set up the stereo telescope than a bullet hit the door and ricocheted into the storehouse, rattling the tank. At first I thought it was an accidental bullet. Someone of the scouts on a stick stuck out a hat and immediately a shot and a hole in the hat. Everything is clear we are detected by an enemy sniper. He will not let us work. The scouts several times stuck out the scarecrow from some rags and each time the sniper sent a bullet. It was dangerous to be in that vault at all. If a bullet hit the tank, we'd go up in flames. Of course, the enemy would not allow us to get out of here before evening. Soon some colonel and a radio operator rushed into the vault. It turned out that this is the commander of some artillery brigade. His NP was somewhere not far from here. Enemy snipers had taken out all those who were at his base. Only he and the radio operator survived. I explained to him the situation here and demonstrated with a scarecrow the sniper did not hesitate to fire. In short, we were trapped. The colonel soon radioed his headquarters and ordered to send sappers to punch a hole in the brick wall on the opposite side. An hour and a half later, the sappers began chiseling the wall. The sniper periodically sent bullet after bullet, but it was already a scare shooting. In the evening, we got out of the trap and took a new position. The attempt of our troops to take Krivoy Rog from the start failed. The command decided to bypass the city from the flanks. Our division began to bypass the city from the right, and quite successfully. For several days, we advanced 25 kilometers. The enemy here offered little resistance. 
in these days our battery-occupied positions near a small village. The population welcomed us with joy, especially the young people. Everything seemed to be going normally. But in the evening we received an order our battery to move 20 kilometers to the right and on the outskirts of the village Ternovatka to take an anti-tank defense. As it turned out later, the enemy urgently pulled to this section of the front its reserves from other directions, including from near Kiev, and threw them into battle to eliminate the breakthrough of our troops. One enumeration of tank divisions participating in this counterattack shows that the enemy was seriously concerned about the actions of our troops. In the battle were introduced tank divisions Adolf Hitler, Great Germany, Dead Head, and a number of other divisions, which were the best in the German army. Hundreds of tanks moved on the positions of our troops. The Soviet units had to withdraw, as they soon ran out of ammunition and fuel for the vehicles. It was necessary to send cars to the Dnieper, where there was the only crossing near the village of Mishurin Rog, but it worked only at night. Enemy aviation was constantly in the air during daylight hours and did not allow the crossing to operate normally. In each battery, including our fourth, there was only one vehicle left, the rest went to the Dnieper for ammunition and fuel. The battery had only a few shells. We collected a dozen or two shells from the whole division, attached the gun and moved forward at night towards the village of Ternovatka. The night is dark, we move without light, we tied a scout on the wing of the car and he commands the driver if he moves off the road or ahead of any obstacle. So we drive by feel. In the back of the car, except for the gun crew, my scouts, there are also two live sheep. I settled down between empty gasoline barrels. The sheep were lying next to me. I warmed up, covered myself with a cloak, which I had received the day before, and I didn't notice how I fell asleep. In the cabin next to the driver sit Battery Commander Senior Lieutenant Elvov, recently appointed in place of the wounded, and the Division Commander Major Sokolov, who replaced the recently killed Kukovenko. The car is slowly moving forward, some time passes. I dream of heavy fighting, shooting, bursting shells. Suddenly someone fell on me. I woke up. There was someone killed on me, obviously from the gun crew. The car was on fire. Furious machine gun bursts were heard. Immediately determined German. It was as bright as daylight around. German flares were taking off one after another, illuminating the area around with dead fire. I can't immediately understand what's going on. There is no one in the body except me and the dead soldier. Dropping the dead soldier, I jump to my feet. The engine of the car is burning. We are standing in the village. On the left, a big field. From there, two machine guns are hitting our car. On the right of the nearest house, and also on our car, sends cue after cue of anti-aircraft gun. The shells in the body are about to explode. It is already on fire. I fall down through the backboard and immediately crawl under the gun between the wheels. The wheels have steel rims so you can protect yourself from the bullets that whistle and dig into the ground somewhere nearby or into the gun, ricocheting and shooting sparks. It is impossible to lie under the gun for a long time soon the shells and the gas tank of the car will explode. But the field is flat, not a bush, not a bump, and rockets one after another light up everything around. I make a dash forward, 10 meters, taking advantage of the fact that the next rocket has already fallen and the new one has just taken off and has not yet warmed up. My new dark-coloured cloak comes in handy. Another rocket falls next to me. I damped it with my hand and immediately make a throw forward, another 15 metres. I fell into a roadside ditch, or rather, a ditch, but it is shallow and it is impossible to hide in it. I was shaken a lot. I heard a strong explosion. I realised that the shells in the back of the truck exploded, and then the gas tank. The car turned into a bright torch, illuminating everything around it. With a characteristic snorting sound a shell flew towards me, I thought will my shell kill me? I clasped my head with my hands to protect myself from the explosion. The shell landed just a metre ahead of me, but did not explode, I thought well done, it was my own. I stretched out my hand it turned out to be not a shell, but a piece of shovel, the handle of which was cut off more than half. I took the shovel in my hand, covered my head with it, and the shells continued to screech away from the car in different directions. 
The enemy machine guns were silenced. Obviously the Germans are afraid, as if not to hit their own. I jumped up, ran another twenty metres, fell into the ditch. I crawled further. The road bifurcates, and I don't know where to crawl to the right or to the left. On the right side there is a separate barn, from which one of the machine guns was beating, of course there are Germans there, and obviously they noticed me, because the rockets are falling in my direction. I crawl along the left ditch, not far to the left is the last house of the village. The firing has stopped, only a car is burning with a crackle, there is something exploding from time to time, obviously the next boxes of shells. The Germans hid to avoid being hit by a stray shell. I crawled back another twenty-five to thirty metres, then got up and went forward. I passed a hundred metres, I see a chain of trenches ahead, with a broomstick in my direction. I could see that they were German trenches, I could see straw in them. I lay down, thinking to all appearances, this is the front line of the Germans and, obviously there are soldiers in the trenches. The trenches are one from another about seven to ten metres from each other, you can't crawl through unnoticed. I crawled closer to the trenches, I calculated if the soldiers are in the trenches, then they of course saw everything and should still observe, because from the beginning of this tragedy passed only a few minutes. I look closely at the German defence, but there is no one there. The first shock syndrome has already passed, and I begin to think Germans usually have a guard with a machine gun and a stock of rockets in the defence at night, and the rest of the troops go to the village for rest. So, the machine gun in the shed is the combat guard, and there should be no one in the trenches. I climbed into the German trench. I had to catch my breath and gather my thoughts, to understand what had happened. I remembered that before leaving I had looked at the map of the battery commander. We had to go to the west, so we had to go to the east, and quickly. The village was near, and the outpost was not more than 150 metres away. I looked at the sky, found the polar star, determined the direction to the east and went. Soon the cornfield began. Every corn I hit seemed to break with a deafening crack. I have no other weapon besides a shovel. The fact is that personal weapons were in short supply and most of the junior officers, including myself, had none. I think it is not difficult to understand my condition in this situation. However, a shovel is something it made it more fun. I walked about 300 to 400 metres, on the right side of the mound and heard conversations, but whose I cannot understand. I come closer, I hear guttural German speech. We must leave quickly, before they found out. The corn field ended, soon the sunflower field began. I went forward, the crackling was even stronger than in the corn. I passed obviously with a kilometre, the field suddenly ended, and I immediately came across a soldier's chain. The soldiers were lying right on the ground, with their heads in the direction from which I was coming. I couldn't believe my eyes were they really my own. I almost cried with joy. I woke up the first one, but he cursed unhappily, turned on his other side and fell asleep again. His Russian swearing was at that moment nicer to me than any other speech or music. I was saved, I was at my side, the grave, terrible danger was over. I was ready to kiss every soldier. Unfortunately, they were all asleep, hugging their rifles. Probably only a Russian soldier can sleep so carefree and without the most basic conditions, right on the ground and close to the enemy soundly. Soon found the company commander, told him what had happened. He replied that he had heard the fight in the village and had seen the glow. I went out on the road and moved towards the village of Lozovatka, through which we had passed in the evening, to go from there to the firing positions where the other guns remained. It was dawning there and here we could see the positions of artillery batteries and Katyusha batteries off the road, camouflage tanks were standing somewhere. I thought that the enemy would not pass through here. But as it turned out, all of them were without ammunition and fuel. As it became known later, both artillerymen and tankers had to blow up their equipment so that the enemy would not get it and retreated back practically without a fight. The sun rose, the day promises to be sunny, which means wait for enemy aviation. I approached the village Lozovatka, in the distance already visible houses. Soon I unexpectedly meet the commander of the gun, with whom we were going to repel tanks. The wounded driver of our car was leaning on him. 
I thought that no one else came out of that ill-fated turn of Utka. And here was a joyful meeting. They told me what had happened there. It turned out that our car did not notice the front edge of our troops in the darkness, and no one stopped us. We came to the village and stood by the roadside on the near outskirts. The division commander decided to find out the situation, got out of the cab and called his orderly, who was sitting in the back. Immediately on the car hit a line of anti-aircraft gun. Battery commander Elvolf, who was sitting in the car, was immediately killed, and the driver was wounded. The division commander and his orderly ran into the vegetable gardens and fled. Everyone who was in the back of the truck began to jump from the car, coming under machine gun fire. Who survived, who died, it was unknown to them. They never met anyone again. I told my story. We sat down, rested and decided to go to the village Lozovatka to hand over the wounded chauffeur to the infirmary. He was wounded in the leg. Soon we came to the village, found a medical station and handed over the driver. With the commander of the gun through the bridge, returned back to the fork of the road and went in the direction of our firing positions from where we left the night before. They walked about two or three kilometres. There was a haystack on the side of the road. We decided to have a rest in the haystack. We lay down on the straw and fell asleep unnoticeably the sleepless night, and the tension we had experienced had an impact. We woke up when the sun was already slipping towards sunset. We could not see anyone anywhere. We thought that our troops had gone far ahead. We quickly gathered towards yesterday's firing positions. Hungry since yesterday, there was not a poppy in their mouths as they say, not a dewdrop. But there was nothing to eat. We passed ten kilometres without meeting anyone. It was already dark, where to look for their firing positions in the dark. We decided to spend the night here. And though we were painfully hungry, but there was no opportunity to eat, and having burrowed into the straw, we pressed ourselves against each other and soon fell asleep. Early in the morning we woke up hungry and cold. It was the end of October, and it was already cold at night in Ukraine. We quickly moved forward, warming up by movement. Soon we saw a small village in the distance. According to our assumption, it is the one we left two days ago. We quickly went there, found our positions on the outskirts, but the trenches were empty, no one could be seen anywhere. We go to the village. No one in the village either, no movement. We go into one house, into another no one. Suddenly, in the vegetable garden of one of the houses, we saw the cellar lid rise and immediately close. We run there. The lid was closed from inside. We knocked. No one answered. We started calling and heard someone hesitantly unlocking the lid. An old man's head popped out. We asked him what happened, why nobody was seen in the village and where our people had gone. The old man, looking around, said that yesterday morning the Germans entered the village, where our artillerymen went, he does not know, and that there was no battle here. Even in the morning today the Germans slept in the village. That's the situation. We asked my grandfather to find us something to eat. It was the second day without food. Looking around he went into the house, and we took shelter in the garden weeds and watched the village carefully. The village is small, only one street, no more than two dozen houses. Nothing suspicious can be seen. Soon my grandfather came, brought some rustic food, and we at least satisfied our hunger a little. We asked him where the Germans had gone. He was sitting with grandmother in the cellar, he didn't see anything, but, to all appearances, the Germans had gone towards Lozovatka. It turns out that ours went not forward, but backward. Apparently we were sleeping so soundly in a straw stack that we didn't hear when the Germans passed along the road. It was good that we buried ourselves in the straw, on the opposite side of the stack from the road. We decided to go to Lozovatka. There is a bridge over the river Ingulitz and there, obviously we should look for our battery. There is no other bridge nearby. When we handed over the wounded chauffeur in Lozovatka, we noticed that there were a lot of wagons and cars in all the yards obviously regimental and maybe even divisional rear. We left the village with precautions, otherwise we could run into Germans. We went not on the road, but on the field, sticking to the plantations, hollows, cornfields. In three hours we saw Lozovatka in the distance. It is on the other side of the river. We came out to the river, and along the high bank we moved to the bridge. Soon we saw the bridge, 
It was about two kilometers away. There was a tank near the bridge. It was hard to make out whose tank it was. We decided to watch the bridge and the village. It looks like a German tank, Angular. It's hard to make out what's in the village. But we can't pass La Zavatka. Only there we can find out the situation and we have to cross the river. But we obviously can't get across the bridge. It's already evening. It's getting dark quickly. We decide to spend the night here and cross the river early in the morning. There is a cattle pen nearby on the bank. It will be useful for raft construction. We broke some corn stalks and made a bed in a hollow not far from the shore. When it got dark, we went to the corral and built something like a raft. We ate raw corn with hunger. We couldn't start a fire, the Germans might notice it. We went to bed, we spent the night and a half sleep. It is cold, we have to get up and run to warm ourselves. Early in the morning we cross the river with difficulty. Of course our feet are wet and our boots are full of water, but it's trifles. Hiding behind the coastal bushes, we approach the village. At the outskirts of the houses we watch the street for a long time. There is no movement anywhere, as if everything has died out. We decide to go into the yard of the nearest house. There is an army wagon, dead horses lying there. The walls are riddled with shrapnel. Not far away is a crater, obviously from a bomb. Enemy aircraft have been working here. We need to find something to eat, but there's nothing suitable. We've gone through a few more yards, the picture is similar. In one of the houses there is a car with bullet and shrapnel holes. There are some boxes in the back. We break one of them cookies. With hunger we pounce on it. The first hunger is satisfied. We dig further. There is some fat in the barrel. It seems to be butter. We had a good snack. I even took a plastic German box with me, besides cookies, put butter in it, and put it in my pocket. We moved along the vegetable gardens closer to the centre of the village. We came out into an alley, and I saw a German tank about 200 metres away. A soldier was sitting on the turret and playing a harmonica. We quickly moved back and, covering ourselves with weeds and bushes, went to the edge of the village in the opposite direction from the bridge. Soon the weeds and bushes are over, the place is completely open, and it is about a kilometre to the ridge behind which we can hide. What to do? We will have to wait for darkness all day long. We decided to move up one by one to the ridge. We split up and go upwards before they noticed us. Soon we heard a German machine gun from behind. It's on us. Bullets raise fountains of earth somewhere behind us. We run to the rescue ridge. It is still more than 100 metres away. The machine gun will give a turn then in my direction, then in the direction of the sergeant with whom we are running. From the tank, from which the machine gun is firing at us, not less than a kilometre, and obviously it saves us. In any case, safely run to the ridge, falling from fatigue and shortness of breath. We crawled a little to the side, rested for a few minutes, and it is necessary to go forward faster, to hide somewhere in a landing or a gully. Ahead of us we see a landing, about a kilometre away. We are going towards the village of Anovka, where we have already spent the night. We have passed more than half of the way to the landing, as from behind we heard the sound of a motor, to all appearances a tank engine. Soon a tank appeared behind us, only the barrel was visible, the rest of the hull was in a cloud of dust. Probably the Germans decided not to miss us. We run with the sergeant, but I stop him we can't hide from the tank. I suggest him to move fifty metres away from me and when the tank comes, to try somehow to dodge it. We are walking slowly, we look back, the tank is not far away. Is it really the end? The sergeant has an automatic rifle. I have a shovel fragment, which I do not part with. When the tank is not far away, I look at it. Why it is not firing, it seems that they want to take us alive. I see a T-34 tank, ours, but where can it be here, when our troops are not visible in the vicinity, and the Germans are nearby? I think the Germans have captured our tank. The tank pulled up, the hatch opens, out of it sticks out the muddy head of a tank driver, who shouts get in, infantry we can't believe our eyes, tears are coming from joy, our own. We did not need to beg, we jumped on the tank, and it rushed forward towards Anivka. The tank driver answered our surprised questions that the tank was defective, it was standing in a ravine in the bushes, not far from the village. 
the crew managed to repair it, and now we have to get through to our own. Dust, engine rumble, incredible shaking, but for us it is the most joyful music. We are again unspeakably lucky, even in joy with the sergeant we sing something at the top of our lungs. But our fun did not last long. From the direction of Crivoy Rog an enemy airplane appeared. Having descended to the lowest height he flew around us, and having made sure that it was a Soviet tank, began to storm us. The plane flies in and fires a line of cannons at the tank. We hide behind the turret. A second volley from the other side, and we again throw ourselves on the other side of the turret. It's like a game of cat and mouse. But we don't have time for games. The tank is practically defenceless against airplane fire, and we are even more so. The shells, hitting the armour, send out a shower of sparks and shrapnel. The tank continues to move forward, and we are rushing from one side of the turret to the other, dodging shells and bullets. How we manage to do it, and even at full speed of the tank, I still can't understand. This game seemed to go on for ages. The tank stopped, obviously a hit in the engine put it out of action, but the airplane, having used up its ammunition, flew away. In exhaustion we fall to the ground. A sharp pain pierces my right leg. Something sticky flowed down the leg into the boot. Is it really wounded? An alarming thought flashed through my head. In such a situation, in the rear of the Germans, it is a bad thing. The tankers are frantically digging in the engine, looking for damage. The plane, of course, will not leave them so, will replenish ammunition, and in half an hour will be here to finish them off. The tank is standing in a clear field, and it is not difficult to find it. The sergeant is fiddling with my leg. Every touch causes severe pain. The tank man comes up. The two of them cut my pant leg and part of the boot, the shin. They look at something there, surprised, then show me. On the sergeant's palm there was some light yellow oily liquid, not like blood, and there was no wound. I went to my pants pocket, and there was a crushed plastic box with oil residue, which I put in Lozovatka and forgot about it. While we were dealing with it, the pain almost stopped. I got to my feet. Everything was normal. It's a laughing matter. Obviously my leg got pinched or pinched while sitting on the tank. The heat melted the oil in the box, and I crushed the can while we were spinning on the tank, dodging shells and bullets. We're laughing. But my pant leg is cut, and my boot is cut. I had to sew it up, which I did without delay. Soon the ill-fated airplane appeared, and started to go in for an attack. We could see well how the enemy pilot was pointing downwards with his finger. We realise that this is his promise to send us to the other world. My companion shows him a dulse, and the tankers threaten him with a fist. That's all we can do in this situation. As the plane turned around, my sergeant and I ran off to one side, the tankers to the other. The airplane began to storm the tank, and we hurry to get away from it. We descended into a ravine and lost sight of the tank. We took shelter in a small bush and decided to rest a bit. Soon we moved forward. In the afternoon we came to Anovka. We lay on the field, looking at the village. Who is there, our own or Germans? So far we see neither of them. On the far outskirts there is some movement, but it has already started to darken, and it is difficult to distinguish. We decide not to take risks, to spend the night and in the morning to understand the situation. There is no straw or corn in the field nearby. Staying overnight in a clear field is not a pleasant prospect, it is cold. On the outskirts of the village there is a dilapidated barn. We think it is unlikely that the Germans will occupy it, there are warm houses nearby. When it got dark we cautiously make our way to the barn. It is quiet, nobody can be seen or heard. We climb inside, there are a lot of sheaves of corn, which is what we need. We rake them up, get inside and disguise ourselves so we can't be seen. We lay down for a while, everything is calm and quiet, only some muffled, barely perceptible sound is heard. I thought it was in my head, after a recent contusion. I whispered about it to the sergeant, and he said that he also heard some rumbling, but from below. We lay down some more, we listen indeed, the rumbling is coming from somewhere below. My companion climbs out of our hiding place, throws away a few sheaves, under them the cellar lid. He opened it, 
went downstairs and whispered to me that there were beehives with bees. Obviously, the owner had put them there for the winter. A bang was heard from the cellar, something fell, and then the sergeant jumped out. In the darkness, he knocked over the hive and the bees spilled out. We quickly closed the cellar and burrowed into the corn. We couldn't eat the honey. We chewed the remains of cookies, which turned into small crumbs in our pockets. Soon we fell asleep. We woke up at dawn, we were freezing. We decided not to go into the village. We didn't pass the front. It means that it is somewhere farther away, especially as the flares were falling somewhere ahead, but not far away. We went around the village along the gully. In two hours we saw a hill on the left and industrial buildings on the top. The weather was overcast, a fine, cold rain was dripping, but by the vague outlines I realised that it was obviously the Schwarz mine, which we had passed three days ago, when we were going to Crivoy Rog. We passed along the plantation for another kilometre, and we saw a car with a gun on a trailer driving along the road at a low speed. By all signs it was not Germans. The car stopped, an officer got out. He noticed us and waved. We approached. It was indeed ours, but they were from some fighter anti-tank brigade, looking for firing positions of their battery. We explained to him that only the enemy was ahead, we had not met our own troops. He, in turn, said that there were patrols of barrier troops nearby, catching everyone who got caught without units, like us. We do not need it at all, you can easily get under the tribunal, and there the conversation is short, at best a penalty battalion, or even firing squad. We go along the front, soon we entered the village, and by the colour of the cant on the epaulets of the officers we find our division, and then our regiment. Our division stands in a ravine. As I later learned, it survived only one gun out of twelve. Captain Durgachev, the chief of staff of the division, saw us. He began to swear in his typical manner, where the hell did you come from? I had just finished compiling new personnel lists. Funerals have already been sent for you, and now I have to correct the list again. I know that he is a kind-hearted man, but he hides his kindness with a constant, unkind grumbling. I tell him that I am ready to sit in his dugout and rewrite the lists several times every day, just so that we do not repeat what we have experienced during these days. He smiled, congratulated us on our return from the other side of the world, and said that he had been told everything by the division commander, Major Sokolov, who had led us to the ill-fated turn of Utka. It turned out that he and his orderly came out of there alive. As it became known to me later, there were still a few people alive, including my scout Andrei Mikhailovich Myasnikov from Mias, with whom we met many times after the war and corresponded. Our regiment lost almost all the guns, one cannon and one howitzer were left. To make it look like we had artillery, the guns were dragged from place to place at night. We would fire a few shots from one position, and then literally carry the guns by hand to another place to fire a few shots there. We had to carry the guns by hand, because it was raining almost daily, the ground was getting muddy, and it was impossible to transport the artillery by car. Soon I was called by the regimental commander and ordered to take command of a mortar battery of 120mm mortars. The thing is that our regimental armed men collected what survived from the mortar batteries on the former line of defence on the Dniper and put into service four repaired mortars. There were plenty of mortars, and here I was to command this battery. Actually, the battery was also the fourth, but instead of guns, mortars. Calculations never served mortars, as well as I never fired them. Cannons can be fired without firing tables. Every artilleryman knows that one division of a site is equal to 50 metres. It is not difficult to determine the site to the target, knowing the distance. With mortars, it is different there every time you have to determine the sighting according to special tables. With guns, the higher the barrel, the farther the projectile will fly. With mortars, this dependence is true only up to a certain angle. Then the higher the barrel of the mortar, the less the range. I think it is clear what is the difficulty for an artilleryman to command, or rather, to control fire from mortars. This difficulty was solved quickly. Not far away was a mortar regimental battery of some paratrooper regiment from our division. I rewrote the table, preparing to fire. My observation post on the height, there stands our tank. The scouts dug a trench under it, 
or rather, a hole two metres deep. At the bottom they widened the hole, brought straw, and slept there. The tank is on top, the rain does not wet us, and the shelter is reliable. Besides, we had a good view from here. Ahead of the village Nadaivoda, it is less than a kilometre away, and it is well visible from here. Although the enemy in our direction threw into battle a large number of tanks, infantry and aircraft, he could not solve his tasks to eliminate the breakthrough of our troops, throw them into the Dnieper, and restore the defence along it. The enemy managed to advance by 20 to 25 kilometres, but his further advance was stopped by the stubborn resistance of our troops. And now our division is defending on the boundary of the village of Nidai Voda. The outskirts of the village and the nearby street are clearly visible from my position. I prepare data for firing. Give a command to the firing position by telephone angle meter, sighting, fuse setting, etc. I give the command fire from the firing position they say fire. I am waiting for a burst. I know that a mortar is not a gun. A mine flies much longer. But there is no burst. But an enemy mine burst near my firing position. I thought has the enemy detected my NP. But we can't be taken so easily. There is a tank above us. Again I give the command fire. I waited. There was no rupture. But there was another rupture near my station. I ordered the senior officer of the battery to check the setting and aiming of the mortar. Soon a report follows that the angle meter, sight, level and aiming are correct. I give the command, give a salvo battery four mines at once, of course. We must see their explosions are quite powerful. The command fire, we look with scouts in the outskirts of the village, where there should be ruptures, but the close ruptures near our tank, under which we are sitting, left no doubt I am shooting by myself. Trying to figure out what's wrong, but I can't find an answer. I decided to go to the firing position and see for myself that everything is okay there. The oppie is about 800 metres behind me in a deep ravine. Everything turned out to be all right at the OP. Had to invite the senior officer of the neighbouring mortar battery. He quickly found the cause. It was raining fine, and boxes with mines open so always do artillerymen during firing. But on the mines the powder charge is in rag bundles and is put directly on the mine. Naturally the bundles got damp in the rain. The mine flies out of the barrel only on the knockout charge, which is located in the tail of the mine, and the main charge is not ignited. Further firing went on normally. For two weeks we sat on this NP under the tank. Perhaps it is appropriate to tell about our life. All day long we are at the NP, conducting observation and, if we have scouted something, we open fire on the targets. There are no other entertainments. We take turns sleeping here, going down to a straw hut one floor below. Food is brought by one of the scouts in turn before dawn, while it is dark, and after sunset. During the daylight hours it is possible to move only by crawling, and that if absolutely necessary you can get under fire of snipers. There is practically nothing to wash with, a small supply of water in flasks is only for drinking. There are no towels or anything like that, and during the whole war one don't remember having any. If we managed to wash ourselves, we usually wiped ourselves with the hollow of our overcoat. That's all our everyday life. I don't remember ever having a bathhouse. And what kind of a bath, if we are always in battle, and if we are taken out of battle, it is only to be quickly transferred to another part of the front. Winter has come, snow has fallen. There are quite noticeable frosts. We are on another section of the front, not far from the previous one. The battery received new standard guns, and mortars surrendered. Now our division is supported by the 13th Guards Airborne Regiment. I with scouts sent to the side NP, here the junction with another division. A small hamlet near the river, a small water mill in the bushes. We settled in a destroyed house, from which in fact remained only the basement. We are doing our usual work, we are conducting surveillance of the enemy. It's snowing, everything is white. We have not been fed for several days. It is not less than three kilometres to the kitchen, and there they cook corn in the morning, at lunch, and in the evening, slightly filling it with some stinking grease, which smells strongly of gasoline. The scout, free from observation, crawls through the cornfield looking for cobs, which we then husk and roast on a piece of iron until the corn crackles. That's all the food. 
One day a scout began to deepen the cellar in which we dwell. One wall of it was destroyed, and we could keep watch without getting out of the cellar. When he threw back the earth a little, potatoes began to appear, though they were very small, a little bigger than a corn kernel, but still potatoes. Digging hard all in the ground, we scraped up almost a whole pot, a treat. We boiled them on the fire, and it seemed that there was nothing tastier in the world. The scouts who were off duty spent all their time to get something to eat. Once the commander of the scouting squad brought a kettle of flour. He jumped excited in our basement and said to me, Lieutenant, take off your undershirt. I have already taken off my pants and traded for flour. The old man at the mill promised to scrape up in the corners with the kettle. I had to take them off and change them. Hunger is not a bad thing. But for two days we feasted, we baked fritters on a piece of iron, though we had no fat. I tell about it only for our descendants to know in what conditions we had to get the victory. A few days later, my scouts and I returned to the main NP of the battery. On December 20th, 1943, I and several other men from our division were summoned to the political department of the division, which was located in a collective farm stable, 10 to 12 kilometers from the front line. There I was handed a party card. So I became a member of the All Union Communist Party. I don't remember any other procedures for joining the party. The new year 1944 we met at the same positions, in the steppe near Krivoy Rog. The defence here had stabilised. The Germans were exhausted and did not think about further offensive. We also did not have enough forces for an offensive. Our troops buried themselves in the ground and kept a strong defence. Dina Propetrovsk region, especially the Krivoy Rog area, are memorable places for us. For almost four months we fought hard battles here. In the post-war time we repeatedly came here for meetings of veterans. All these meetings were exceptionally warm and exciting. In those villages through which we passed, literally the whole population from small to great came out. Everywhere there were spontaneous meetings, laying flowers on the graves of our comrades in arms, tears, memories of battles. In every village they tried to feed us, to treat us with everything that the Ukrainian land is rich in. Once we passed Anivka, which is memorable to me. It was not planned to stop our column of veterans here. This village belonged to Kirovograd region, and the meeting was organized by the authorities of Dnepropetrovsk region. But the population of the village of Anivka, having somehow learned that we would be passing through here, came to the road, stopped our convoy, and with tears in their eyes begged us to hold the meeting in their village as well. Of course we could not refuse them. Our meeting was delayed for three hours, and in Lozovatka, where we were going, the whole population was waiting patiently for us to meet them. The winter of 1944 had fully entered its rights. The weather is frosty and rather snowy, and although the frost is relatively small, 10 to 15 degrees, but it is cold in the trenches. We have a small dugout. We dug a hole, dug deeper on one side so that we could stand. We got earth and bunks and a passage along them. We built a kind of stove out of tin, covered it with whatever was possible branches from the nearest planting, stalks of sunflowers and corn, straw everything came into play. A little earth on top, that's the whole trick. The dugout is not pretty, but still warmer than in a trench. Here in defence we stood until the middle of January 1944. Our troops were regrouping their forces. The Krivoy Rog Nikopol offensive operation in the fall of 1943 was not completed, the 4th Ukrainian Front could not overcome the enemy resistance and reach the Dnieper River in the area east of Nikopol, and the 2nd Ukrainian Front got bogged down in fighting for Krivoy Rog. In turn, the 1st Ukrainian Front, under the command of General Vachutin, after the successful capture of Kiev, advanced far to the west towards Jitomir. Between the 1st and 2nd Ukrainian fronts in the area from Kremenchug to Kaniv, the enemy held the defence line along the Dnieper. A kind of a sack was formed, in which there were quite a lot of German troops. The supreme command of our troops decided to conduct an offensive operation by the adjacent flanks of the two fronts in order to encircle and destroy the enemy grouping. Our 1st Guards Airborne Division was withdrawn from the 37th Army, stuck near Krivoy Rog, and was transferred to the area of Kirovograd, where it became part of the 53rd Army 
and participated in the offensive operation, which was later called the Battle of Korsun Shevchenkovo, after the name of a small Ukrainian city that was at the center of the battle.